Look at that smile. Don't you want to take this kid to Hollywood? Right now, we want to take him aboard T-504. Dan Russell, they're calling the gift buckle. And here is another, one of the ten best bulls in the country, one of the five best bulls that Dan Russell owns, and one of the five best cowboys that are riding. I'm glad you put that in there. If you're going to bake a cake, you want to put the right frosting on it. And that's exactly what we're doing as you watch the final moments as Michael Gaffney gets ready to ride. For those of you that may be watching this video for the first time, I think that our cameraman here gave you an excellent example of how to get your hand in the rope, how to get the rope ready. Now, watch what he does with the tail of it as he goes around behind the hand, tucks it in position, up under the thumb, puts the roll in the curl so it goes back to the fingers. He's tied on, but he can get away. G-Man, let's ride a bull. Yeah. This is... Wow. Gaffney at his finest. Now, Michael Gaffney has a style of pushing on his hand, maybe as hard or harder than anybody else, not pulling. And for the last of 1992, he has been on the injured list, and you see him right here, hanging that right shoulder. That has to hurt. Where did the power come from? Well, the bull put it to him to start with, but he's had a lot of shoulder injury. The day may come, it could take an operation to get him back in position. But in this particular ride, you'd never know that he had an ounce of pain. The bull wails, the bull flails, the bull hits, then the drop and the turn back. The upper part of the body, look at him wave his hand. He rides like a ballerina. Absolutely phenomenal. Michael Gaffney is definitely not only a 93-point bull rider in this scene, but a leader of the future of the 90s. Michael Gaffney's career ran from 1995 to 2005, so about 11 years. And in that time, he rode a Brahmin bull, sometimes called Brahma bulls, uh, 335 times. Imagine that. In 10 or 11 years, riding Brahma bulls 335 times. And of those rides, he was successful 47, over 47% of the time. That meant that he rode a Brahmin bull eight seconds, over 47 of the time. Now, the guy's a little loony. I mean, who does that? But it's amazing to me, a guy that can do this. I mean, I, I get nervous. As you know, horses kind of freak me out. Uh, if a horse starts trotting, I'm not sure I can stay on it for eight seconds. So this is amazing to me, a Brahmin bull, that he would ride this like this. And, and, and when I go horseback riding, like in the mountains, those, I mean, horseback riding, you're in those long trail of horses, right? And uh, so my favorite one was in Colorado when my horse had asthma. That's what I really pray for, a sick horse. And I tell them I want it dead broke, and the operative word is dead. The deader, the better, right, for me. When they turn around with that ginormous eyeball, you know, they look around, they look around like this with that huge eye looking at me. I mean, I'm like, I, through mental telepathy, I'm saying, okay, we both know I don't belong here. So let's just get through this without incident, okay? Can we do that? So it's amazing to me, a guy like Michael Gaffney, who was such a successful bull rider, went on to become a commentator and all, that he could do that. It's amazing to me. But the part that fascinated me the most when I watched this was the time and focus he put in to gripping that, that his hand on that rope. They call it the wrap, that process they call the wrap. He spent almost 60 seconds getting his hand wrapped just right in that grip in order to endure just eight seconds of fury. Now, why is that significant to me? Well, I think a lot of times people leave their homes facing the struggles of their lives, the Brahma bowls, if you will, of their lives, the temptations, the anxieties, the pressures, the stresses on our lives, the, the, the accusations, the gossip, the, it's just all the stuff that we face, and we leave our home without ever getting a grip. And so we face life, it's like riding a Brahma bull without having a grip. Imagine what that would do to us. That's what the world tends to do if we don't get a grip. So we've been talking about God creating out of us this masterpiece. And we looked at last week as we opened this up and introduced it, we looked at two aspects of Jesus' life. First, his redeeming actions, the cross, the resurrection, the ascension, things like that, those things that get us to heaven. 
But then we consider his restorative lifestyle, those things that get heaven into us. And we learn that we can actually practice what Jesus practiced because he gave us patterns. He modeled for us how to live life and to be more human because a lot of what we do is actually contrary to the image of God within us. So we looked at the fact that we need motivation and we looked at that motivation comes from gratitude, being thankful for what God has done for us in Christ, the forgiveness that we then love others with that same love. We talked about preparation, how that in this world, our faithfulness and the things that we, we do in following Jesus, uh, they seem to be connected with whether it's responsibility or rewards, it's a little uncertain, but there seems to be a definite connection between how we live here and, and how we enter the realm called heaven. And then the third thing we talked about is just skills for coping with life. That following Jesus' example gives us some solid ways of living life more skillfully. Unless we just want to live from drama to drama with meltdowns and resentments and unhealthy stress and anxieties and all of that stuff, and if we want to just live with, with social media and other people uh, defining our self-worth and our value, if we want to live that way, then ignore all this. But if we want to live life better than that, more skillfully than that, then we want to learn how Jesus lived life. And in his humanness, because he's the God-man, he's all a God and he's all a man, but in his humanness, he was walking in these things that kept him aligned with Father God, and we want to learn that. So in the, in the next few weeks, we're going to look at five different things. I'm using the candle, the candle for Jesus' life of centering. And we're going to talk about more, more about that rather today. So centering. Next week, we'll look at meditation upon Scripture or meditating. The third week, we'll look at, or, or two weeks from now, we'll look at, um, or after the Youth Sunday, I suppose it will be, we'll look at praying. And Jesus said, this kind only comes forth by praying. Well, the Jews prayed three times a day. So it had to be something more than just kind of the traditional praying that we want to talk about. Uh, the fourth week that we'll look at this, uh, we'll look at the words we speak and the power of the words we speak. And I'm using a paintbrush, sort, sort of like Bob Ross, the masterpiece that God is painting uh, with us. And we'll talk about how Hebrews 11 says that by faith we understand the worlds were framed by the word of God so that what we see was not made of things which do appear. And then the last week, the sixth week total of this series, beginning the last week and then on till we're done, will be on serving. The spiritual discipline or the method of Jesus for serving uh, and the towel representative of his washing the disciples' feet. But I want to talk about centering to start off today. And as we think about centering, what I think it is, is the alignment of our soul, our will, our mind, our emotions, with the Holy Spirit who indwells us. And the reason I think that centering is important is I think centering creates an inward environment more powerful than outward circumstances. I want you to think about that for a minute. Centering creates an inward environment more powerful than outward circumstances. You mean I don't have to be tossed to and fro by every gust of wind and every circumstance in life? Does that mean that I don't feel grief when a loved one goes home to be with the Lord? No, it doesn't mean that. But it does mean that I don't have to be thrown off center. I've got a place to, to retreat to or to, in, to be indwelled by a center that keeps me in the focus of God's heart, whatever the situation may be. So centering is our soul, our will, our intellect, our mind, and emotions being in sync with the Holy Spirit who indwells our human spirit. And that alignment is what I believe we refer to as centering. Now, in the centering process uh, that, that creates this inner atmosphere or inward environment, it's sort of like how a, a clock, no matter what devastating thing is happening, the clock just keeps ticking. Well, within us, this centering in Christ can create an inner atmosphere, an inner environment that allows us to be stronger in him 
than the external or the outward circumstance that, that we're dealing with. But it's not a one-size-fits-all. We'll be talking about technique, but we center differently, and that's okay. We have different ways of being wired. We have different affinities. We have different ways of, of being attached to God and detaching from distractions and different ways of honoring the holy and different ways of discerning God. But those components need to be a part of our centering, I think. Tiger Woods, I'm told, says that uh, regarding a golf swing, that do whatever works. Do whatever works. Well, that's pretty good advice with centering as well. If what you're doing in the way you're living your life, if you are spending that time that allows you to really attach to God's presence within you and allows you to detach from the distractions and some of the stuff going on, the craziness, allows you to, de to detach from that, if what you're doing allows you to honor the holy in the midst of a lot of profane stuff, and if what you're doing allows you to discern the movement and the will of God, that's your swing. Keep doing it. But if your spiritual swing is always hitting slices, always hitting hooks, or you're missing the ball, or you're duffing it, and your, your sod is going farther than your ball is, then you got a problem because your swing isn't working. So then you have to find someone whose swing is working and model your life after their swing until you get your own swing. So as we look at centering, that which creates this inward environment more powerful than outward circumstances, I want us to consider the ADHD of that. The attachment that comes with centering, attachment to the inner Christ, the detachment from the distractions uh, of the world, the honoring of the holy as, as we recognize that we are temples of the living God and that all around us, when, we're, when we become aware of the master artist, aware of God, then we are honoring that sacred space and of discerning the will of God. So we want to talk real quickly about those four things. So I want to begin with attachment and detachment of centering. Uh, Luke chapter 5, verse 16, it says, Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. He often withdrew. What's that mean? That means it was a pattern in his life, right? He often withdrew to these places. So that just was a normalized way in which he lived, often withdrawing to the lonely places and praying there. Carl Jung, the great Swiss psychiatrist, says that hurry is not of the devil. Hurry is the devil. Hmm. What do you think about that? Hurry is not of the devil. Hurry is the devil. It's kind of become a cultural mantra for us. Crazy busy. We've got some friends that we jokingly will say. have been friends of ours for years and years and years. And we'll jokingly say, when we ask them about doing something, uh, Ray and I'll joke and say, oh, wait, they're crazy busy. Never going to work because they're crazy busy. And I'd say about 70% of the time, they can't do it because they're crazy busy. It's almost a mantra that we just kind of, we laugh about, crazy busy. I want you to think about the destructive element of that. Busy is one thing. Crazy busy is another. There's always been this tie for centuries between prayer and work. We ought to be active. But crazy busy is another step. And Jesus said the enemy the thief of our soul, the enemy comes to steal and kill and destroy. Well, how do you think that happens? How do you think the enemy steals, kills, and destroys? I mean, does he basically come on your headset or your earbuds and say, uh, this is the devil, just wants you to know that you're going down today. Does he do that? I don't think so. It's much more subtle. And if we can get so busy that we cannot hear the Father. That's destructive. We have to find ways of hearing from God. Now, we have to adjust that to many things in our lives. We get that. But the fact that Jesus needed to withdraw to places of quiet and silence tells us that we need that component in our lives. However we end up finding that, we need that. I think one of the toughest things about being Christian in a, 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 a quasi-Christian culture and within the church world, one of the hardest things is saying no to really good things in order to say yes to the best things. 
I think it's really hard to do. It takes a lot of discipline to say no to stuff that that's really good, but I want them to have all the opportunities. It's hard to say no to good stuff in order to say yes to the best stuff. It also means you have to identify what's the best stuff. And that takes some mind work and spirit work to do that. So he often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. Psalm 4.4 4 says, search your hearts and be silent. Now that's interesting, the, the wording, the way it, I would have said, uh, be silent and search your hearts. Because in my silence, that's when I want to search my heart. This says search your hearts and be silent. As a result of searching your heart, come to the sense of valuing silence. So search your heart and then be silent. Recognize it as a value of being in that place of listening or hearing God. 1 Kings 19, 13, um, Elijah is like completely drained. He's exhausted. He wants to die. And in fact, he, he says, take me home. I'm, done. I'm, I'm tired. I'm exhausted. He's depressed. He's discouraged. He's down and out wants to die, wants to go home, and an angel appears to him and says, what's up? And he says, oh, I just can't make it. I'm tired. I'm exhausted. I want to go home. And the angel says, eat this, feeds him, and then says, go to sleep. You need a nap. And sometimes we do just need some rest. And so then he sleeps. He wakes up. The angel feeds him again. He takes another nap, a long sleep. And then the angel says, I want you to head to the Mount of God, which is a long ways away, Mount Horeb. And so it's interesting because there we see Elijah attaching to God and in order to attach, detaching from what he has known and the fear that's behind him and heading to the mountain of God. We've got to have attachment and detachment and centering. What do you need to attach to? The inner Christ. What do you need to detach from? Well, you'll have to fill in the blanks for that. Elijah heads to the mountain of God and so he arrives there and he's in the cave and there are three really powerful manifestations that come. There's the wind, there's an earthquake, there's fire, but it says about all three of them that God wasn't in the wind. He wasn't in the earthquake. He wasn't in the fire. All the pizzazz stuff, the drama stuff, God wasn't in them. And then it says there was a still small voice, and God was in the still small voice. And some scholars believe it's best translated that God was in the sound of sheer God was in the sound of sheer silence. Because it's in that place that oftentimes that soul stillness where God can speak the loudest. Sometimes we'll, we'll negate things that God so longs for us to be able to be brought into and to grow in because, well, that's boring. I don't like that. I've never been able to do that. And so we'll dismiss things that real, out of hand that really... It's a part of what Jesus did and that we have to cultivate. It's sort of like exercise. Centering and all of these disciplines, it's, it's a lot like exercise. Some people, it just comes natural to them. Exercise, for some people, it's just kind of a natural thing. For others, we have to work at it. But all of us need it, right? All of us need it. Whether you're just naturally inclined and you're very athletic, you've always been that way, that's one thing. But just because you're not that way doesn't mean you still don't need exercise. You do need to find ways that you can exercise and you'll be consistent with it. That's important. But you still need to exercise. And it's the same as centering. And then finally, Psalm 46.10 says, Be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I am God. And the literal rendering of that, be still, is cease from striving and know that I'm God. What are you striving against? What are the things that you're striving with right now, just your soul may be anxious about? Cease from striving and know that I am God. So I talked to a young lady recently about centering. She's a believer. She's got three kids. I said, so how do you center? You have three kids. How do you center? <laughs> well, she said, I don't get much quiet, <laughs> and I don't get a lot of inactivity. So how, well, how do you do it then? Because, you know, we're not asking people to run to a monastery or live under a rock or something and wear a robe and chant. So how do you center? How do you get attached? How do you detach? How do you honor the holy? How do you discern God's will? She said, for me, it's when I'm out my exercise walk or I'm jogging. Or if I'm home, she said, I can read something over and over and over and not comprehend it. I can read it. 
and read it again. I don't know if any of you are like that, but she can read it and read it again. And just finish. She says, it's not until I take notes on it, and it's not until I journal. That's what imprints it upon my heart, journaling. So she has found how she can center, and that's really important. She doesn't need to center like I do. Me, for me, I can think in terms of yielding head to heart, and it's like a line, a tight line going down into the, the, like the solar plexus, that ganglia of nerves, only spiritually speaking, that center within. I can just sort of envision that inwardly. That doesn't work for her, but she can center in that way. Talk to a young man, and, uh, and he's, he has attention span issues, he says, and he may. But I said, so how do you center? Because you're clearly a Jesus follower. How do you center? He said, for me, it doesn't work to close my eyes. <laughs> you know, that, that may work for you meditating types, but for me, uh, it doesn't work. I have to go outside, and the stimulation, the senses of all the nature around me, that helps me to get it in focus around Jesus. Now, I don't know exactly how that works, but it works for him. That's how he attaches to Christ and detaches from the distractions and honors the holy and discerns God. It's like in a nature setting and he, with his eyes open. But that works for him. And he's finding ways of centering with how he's put together, but he's making time for that. I have a good friend who is a hunter, and I'm not a hunter. I, I went hunting some when I was a kid out with my dad. He really wasn't a hunter either. When I shot something, I just felt guilty and bad. And one time I was just with some kids down at the schoolhouse, and there were these ivy vines, like filled with vines on the wall of the schoolhouse, and there were birds that would make nests in there. And we just thought it'd be cool to throw rocks into it and watch the birds flutter out. And I hit a bird. I felt like Opie Taylor on Andy Griffith, you know? I hit a bird. And the bird fell, and I felt absolutely awful, and so I took the bird, just like Opie, only the bird was lifeless, it seemed, and I put it back in a nest, and then later it was gone, so I was hoping, I'm hoping it wasn't a cat, that he just flew away, but I still remember that. I just am not a killer. I'd rather hunt with a camera, but I have friends who are hunters, and, and I'm, hey, I'm not against eating meat. I mean, they give us deer sausage and stuff, but where he draws, where he centers, it doesn't matter whether I get a deer or not. Just being out in the woods, that's where I center in the spirit of Christ. Hey, and it's a powerful thing. I've got another good friend. You know where he centers? Uh, he centers best when he's driving in the car alone. That's where he centers. Out, no one's around, shuts his phone off, and he centers while he's driving. Other people I know, it's music, just soft music or whatever in the background. It just helps him center. You get the point. Whatever your swing is, as long as it's working to attach you and detach and to honor the holy and to discern the will of God, then keep doing that. But if it's not working, then find someone kind of in your style and adopt that until you find your own swing to attach and to detach. Then I want to look at the next two of centering. Attachment, detachment, honoring the holy, and discernment. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19 says, Don't you realize that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you and was given to you by God? That's a great question, isn't it? Don't we realize that? We're temples of the Holy Spirit. You know how on, on the end of Sundays I'll say, you leave this place, but you're not leaving God. God's going with you. That's what I'm talking about. Don't you realize you're temples of the Holy Spirit? I know this can get to sounding kind of strange, but I thought about the implication of what it means to be temples of God and what it means for every part of our lives. And I was talking to my grand, one of my grandkids, the oldest, actually, 15, and he was at our house and he was eating. And he was eating as though he was conquering this helping of food and then he was going to get more. And I, I, I said, I, and I, I know this is going to sound weird, because we're conditioned to eat fast. Public school tell you know, you have 20 minutes, and if you can get done sooner, then you can go shoot some hoops or whatever you do. And so I get that. We're conditioned. But I said to him, as goofy as I know this is going to sound, I said, have you ever considered <laughs> savoring every bite? I know it's not laughable, but that's what I said. Have you ever considered savoring every bite? 
You know, this is a gift. And you're a temple. And think about being mindful. I don't think I use that word because you know, what is Grandpa talking about now? When I, when I tell my daughter this, she says, okay, Grandma Boatman, we'll savor every bite because it sounds a lot like my mom. But nonetheless, think about being mindful of everything we do as temples of the living God. So I'm walking down at Copper Creek Lake a couple weeks ago, and I had one of those awesome kind of weird encounters that it's like, like just for a few seconds, it's like everything is brimming with life. No, I'm not talking about having some hallucination, but just, just sensing the divine artist has imprinted himself upon all of creation. Just like a great artist will imprint himself upon the canvas, there is that of God in everything. So I was thinking about the grass and the swooping sparrows and, and the geese and everything around us. Now, you do have to watch the geese because they lay some droppings on the way. And Jesus said, watch and pray. I'm often reminded of that passage when I'm walking around the lake. Watch and pray. Nonetheless, it's all brimming with life. And I want to learn to be mindful of that. So you slow down. And those things that you can slow down in, whether it's traffic lights or eating, you slow down and you get mindful because you are temples of the Holy Spirit. It ought to affect how we think and live and talk and walk because we are surrounded in a fallen world by much that is profane. And we can't help it. We're touched by it. You can't walk through a smoke-filled room without smelling like smoke, right? It affixes itself to us. So it makes it even more important that we exert energy to be mindful and create holy space, honoring the holy. And the more we're aware of God, the more we are honoring the holy. Imagine, young people, if you're at school and you're walking down the hallway and in your heart, hear me, in your heart, you're just pausing to give God thanks. As you're walking along, maybe to the next class, I know maybe you're in a hurry. You're walking more like this. i got to get there. But thank you for the air I breathe. Or maybe you're doing a quick breath prayer. Oh, beloved, I love you. Jesus, I love you. How, what's the percentage of young people in that school, in that moment, who are doing that? Probably not real high, I would guess. So you're there in that place, and your awareness in that school hallway is holy ground. You have honored the holy. You are acknowledging God in the midst of your day. And that's like the burning bush, only right there. It's your high school. You're honoring God. So part of centering is learning to honor the holy that is God all around and within through Christ. A part of centering is discernment. Jesus practiced this a lot. Almost every. In fact, I don't know of a major thing that he did, but what the, the Gospels preface it with, his going to a solitary place, going to a place alone to pray. And then out of that, he would teach the Sermon on the Mount or face confront the enemy, or he would heal the multitudes, or he would feed the 5,000. He would choose the 12. All of that came after a time of solitude, silence, discerning from God through what I would call centering, him being aligned with the Father's heart. The one I've chosen is Mark chapter 1, verses 35 and 38. Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house. He got up and left the house. Because he's staying, I think, at this point in Capernaum, which is Peter's house. So Peter's mother-in-law and wife, they're going to be getting up pretty soon and, you know, clanging clay pots, however they clang. And it was still dark, so Jesus got up and left the house and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Maybe that's your car. Maybe that's a walk in the woods for you. Maybe it's like Susan, Suzanne Wesley, John Wesley, the founder of Methodism, his mom, who had like, I don't know, I forget, 14 or 15 kids, lots of kids, lots of activity in their home. And her prayer place was in her rocking chair with an apron draped over her head. And the kids know you don't bother mama when she's got an apron on her head. That may be your place, whatever it is. It may be, for some of you ladies with two, three, four kids, 
Are you guys? But the ladies, especially with this one, it may be the bathroom with a locked door. Honey, you watch the kids for a while, and it's cow gone. Take me away. That may be your centering place. So Jesus leaves the house, goes to a, a solitary place where he prayed. When the disciples found him, so he stays there a while. They're looking for him. They find him. Now, don't you know, they're kind of sensing, feeling some pressure. We've got to, there's still stuff to do in this village. People are waiting on you. They're looking for you. Where are you? And Jesus replied, let us go somewhere else, to a nearby village. Nearby villages, so I can preach there also. That is why I've come. How do you know to do that? Discernment. How do you say yes? How do you say no to really good things? Staying in the village and building on the ministry there and instead going to other villages. How do you say yes to the best and no to the good? Discernment. But you have to be in that place where God can let you know as good as this is. It's not my best. And you only have 24 hours in a day. And you're going to sleep eight of them seven or eight of them. you got 16 hours you're working with here. This is good, but you need to say no to this because this is best, and you need to say yes to that. Now, we've got to have a place to get started. Most people, most people aren't going to start out, you know, like exercise. You know, start out too big. If you're already there, your swing is working, you're able to attach in Christ and detach and honor the holy and discern, and that's working moderately well for you, then keep your swing. But if you're not there, I want to give you a three-minute challenge. I want to give you an entry level that can be life-altering. It can change you if you'll do this. And here's how it works. All of us sometimes wake up and we feel lousy, right? I mean, isn't that pretty universal? You wake up and, oh, man. I've got halitosis of my whole body. I mean, just everything. It stinks. It's bad. I'm hurting. I'm in pain. I don't feel like getting up. Um, it's really hard on me when it's Sunday morning. Uh, you know, because you got to go anyway, right? You feel lousy, and what are you going to do? You're at a crossroad. Because I think at that point we have a decision to make. Are we going to just give in to the way the mental and emotional pathway is working in our head right then and take that halitosis into the job or into our school or wherever? Or are we going to make a decision to change tracks, changing the trajectory of how I'm going to live that day. Because I think we can make that decision. It takes Christ. Paul said, I lay hold of the one who has taken hold of me. But we're choosing to take hold of him, the one who has taken hold of us. And to shift the trajectory of how we're thinking and our emotional uh, way of doing things that day. I don't know, a quick example. I used to have this train that had metal tracks, and maybe some of you have that, electric trains with metal tracks, right? And did you ever have your train get off track, but it was still moving? Is that, is that an experience you've had? How many of you had, how many of you know what I'm talking about, right? Yeah, it gets quiet up here some days. So anyway, so you have this train, and yet it would, you know, a wheel would get off track, and so it's still moving, but it's squeaky, it's going, right? That's how we are when we're feeling lousy and we don't do anything about it. We go to work ee, like this. We go to school ee, like this. We're moving, but it's pretty awful, right? Well, what if we could shift that train back on the track? That's the three-minute challenge. Because I think that we're created for our mind and our emotions to respond to decisions. David said, Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. Have you ever thought about that? He didn't say, well, it feels like my soul's in a blessing mood today. No. He said, bless the Lord, O oh my soul. That's a directive. So when you awaken and do whatever you need to do initially, you know, go to the bathroom or whatever, but then take three minutes. I want to challenge you this week to practice this and see if it works for you. I think it will. Take your first minute and make it a minute of gratitude. Really focus, honestly think, what am I thankful for? What am I thankful for? What if it were taken away from me, would I just be at a loss? Well, then you're thankful for that. Be thankful. 
Take a minute and think of the things you feel grateful for in your life and give God praise for that. Second minute, make it a minute of praying for someone. Be specific, say it out loud, or quickly write it down, or in your mind formulate the words, Lord, I know Mike is going in for a consultation with a doctor today. I pray that the results that they found will be amazing, that the cancer will be departing his body. But if that's not the case, then I pray for you to keep him so centered in your calm and your strength that he'll sense you immediately, giving him the power to face the results. Real prayer, real circumstances, just a few days ago for me. Third minute, ponder who you're going to serve, how you're going to serve today. Think of a real situation that you can serve someone today. School, lunchroom, sitting with someone you would not normally sit with to just encourage them at work, whatever it is. Think of how you can serve today. Ponder it, plan it, and do it. And just take a minute to do that. Ponder it and plan it. That's three minutes of your early morning life that helps you take the train from that to back on track to where you've changed the trajectory of your day, your emotional and mental pathways just by three minutes. You've readjusted your GPS, right? Gratitude, prayer, serving, GPS. You've changed the GPS. You've aligned it with the Spirit of Christ. And it can affect the whole trajectory 